there's so many different types of yoga teacher trainings out there that you can take different styles. You can focus on different lengths of time, intensives, spread outs, 200 hour, 500 hour, all these different things. Uh, it can be kind of overwhelming, can be kind of confusing. So today I have Michelle Font coming on. Uh, Michelle is a yoga instructor and a teacher trainer. And we're going to talk about the different styles, uh, how to choose a program that fits you, um, how to look at the instructors and ask the questions that you need to to make sure they're the right fit for you and you're the right fit for them. Um, the different types of ideas and stacking yoga styles in one teacher training, um, what 500 hour teacher trainings look like on location versus local, all these different things, all these different opportunities that we have to build the, uh, the learning experience that we want. So I'm going to take some time with Michelle today to dive into her journey, how she got to where she's at. And then we're going to really dissect teacher trainings in general and help you find the one that'll fit best for you. Hope you enjoy the journey. We'll see you on the other side. But first, a message from our sponsor. Our healing journey can be difficult. It might feel lonely at times. That's why I love sound baths. When we can get together in a community, we intrinsically support and feel supported by others. And that combined energy can help us go deeper into our own healing journeys. And all you have to do is just lay there for one hour and listen to beautiful healing sounds. I'm a sound healing practitioner, and I hold sound baths on a regular basis in the greater Seattle area. You can find my next sound baths on my website at adamrealhealing.com. That's Adam, A-D-A-M, real, R-I-E-H-L, healing, H-E-A-L-I-N-G, dot com. Adamrealhealing.com. Your healing is worth your time. And now an uninterrupted podcast with Michelle Font. All right, welcome back to our show. Uh, today I'm talking to Michelle Font. Uh, Michelle is a uh, 200 and 500 hour uh, RYT. Uh, she's an ERYT in the 200 hour, and she's also YSEP uh, certified through Yoga Alliance. Um, Michelle and I have uh, met each other through the yoga community. Uh, Michelle has deep, deep history in yoga. She's been doing this for a while. She's been teaching for a while outside of yoga, and so has a beautiful history of understanding how to teach people, how to meet people with where they're at. Um, so one of the things today we're going to talk to Michelle about just her journey in general, how she got into yoga and how that has transitioned into where she's at now. Uh, but also, um, one of the things that Michelle is really, uh, uh, excited about is helping people find the right teacher training program. And that's one of the things that she does. She's a teacher trainer. And so having, and I'm actually a past teacher trainer myself. I used to do, a, um, uh, worked with open up yoga for a couple of years, uh, right outside of my teacher training. And so we're going to have a talk today about how to find the right teacher training program for you, the different styles that are out there, the different types of teaching styles, the different types of yoga styles, um, the different ways of like the time management, right? There's, there's, um, there's, uh, spread out yoga teacher trainings. There's intensive yoga teacher trainings. There's on location. There's all this stuff, right? So we're going to talk about how to find the best program for you. Right. But first, just want to get to know Michelle a little bit better. So first off, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. Appreciate your time. <laughs> of course. Um, so, you know, we've, uh, we've met each other through Renton CrossFit. Mm -hmm. Um, you've been to a few sound baths. You're uh, uh, teaching there currently. Yes. Um, but, uh, how did you kind of find your way into this beautiful path of yoga? Like, how did you get to this space that you're at now? Yeah. Um, uh, wow. Well, it's, I was doing the math while you were speaking and it's been about 17 years wow. since my very first yoga class awesome. and I did not know what a yoga class would even consist of. I was just completely blind to what it was. I knew I thought there would be lots of stretching and I thought, right. wow, I'm <laughs> flexible. I can do this. I got this. But the person that took me, took me to a Bikram yoga class okay. and it was a 90 minute. That Those was my hot. very first class. And the first thing I realized was I'm wearing the wrong clothes for this and maybe too much. <laughs> yeah. And then I thought, I have never sweat so much in my life, but it felt good. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I loved about the teacher was she was able to tell us physiologically what was happening with our body with each pose. So it made me want to hold the pose longer. Mm, okay. And I... I had also knew nothing about Bikram and, and the history right. or the scandals or anything like that at that time. And I just thought, wow, cool. A place where I can like 
detox physically and also receive benefits to my body. Um, I just remember being very uncomfortable and she said, this is helpful for your thyroid and hormone balancing. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to hold, <laughs> hold this plow pose longer. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, I would never put myself in that position, right. you know, before. So I just became really interested in learning more about the poses and how they would benefit my body. And so I started, I'm an engineer by background, so mm -hmm. I did lots of research research in my past and I just would use the power of, of the internet and start Googling and um, just searching for different poses or if I had something I wanted to work on I would say you know what poses are good for and fill in mm -hmm. the blank and um, I just it almost became an obsession to just kind of treat myself <laughs> in a way and then um, and at least know the background so that when I would go to other teachers that weren't telling me what it helped with in my head, I would knew. Mm -hmm. So it was more of what benefit is this doing for my body and for my energy? Yeah. And then, um, you know, the yoga practice wasn't consistent immediately. And I took probably seven years off. And then I started going back more consistently. And it was always hot yoga that mm -hmm. I went to. Um, and then, and then finally, in um, when I made it to a community in Ballard, there used to be a, a Baptiste Vinyasa okay. studio called Shakti. Yeah, I and, remember Shakti um, very well. Shakti, I think maybe still exists in, in Bellevue. Bellevue. I think is the only one left. Yeah, yeah, and they had such a beautiful, tight community there, and it was so welcoming mm. and so loving. They used beautiful language for getting you in and out of the poses, and it felt so safe for me to be there as a student. Yeah. And um, they had this program that they did um, once a year, and it was 40 Days to Personal Revolution. Okay. And it follows the book by Baron Baptiste, yes. which, you know, things are coming out about that as well. Yes. So it's really interesting that my two, like, my core memories with yoga were both with people that I had or their styles that I had no idea of these background things. Right. But anyway, so that program really helped me through a personal journey that I was going to uh, get healthier. Uh, through the program, we abstained from caffeine, alcohol, tobacco, mm. and sugar. Okay. We did yoga practice six days a week. We did meditation twice a day. Beautiful. We did reading, excavation questions, and then we had community meetings once a week. Okay. So it was like everything you need to really get yourself integrated into all aspects of yoga in the physical and mental form. Yeah. And then have the community to support you. And then... Um, it, it didn't take very long. It was maybe a year after I became a consistent um, practitioner of yoga at the studio that I decided I wanted to just learn it all myself. And yeah. I chose to do a yoga teacher training. I went to my 200 hour intensive mm -hmm. um, in Hawaii. Oh, beautiful. And it was beautiful. It was the very last in-person training before the world shut down okay. in 2020. Wow. Okay. And so um, that was... Yep, that was three years ago, yeah. and um, I got my certification, but I knew that teaching inside of four walls wasn't necessarily where my future was going with yoga. I just didn't know where. Okay. So I did yoga in the forest, yoga in the park. Um, I did so many different things, as well as taught at RCF in Renton, mm -hmm. and, um, and eventually I just realized my love for teaching is more of being an educator. Yeah. And in order to become an educator, I needed those 500 hours. I needed a lot more teaching hours. So I kept teaching. I actually ran the 40 day program on my own and created video tutorials for mm. people to follow along instead of reading a book. Cause okay. the, the book describes all the different poses for a basic vinyasa class. And, um, I think it's hard to self teach through a book. It it is so, at times. It, it's a, definitely a process you had to figure out for yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I read the book aloud and then I did um, a video recording to follow the words mm. so that people could just hit play and then check on the screen if they're, you know, interpreting the instructions correctly. That's great. So it was really nice, really fun to do. And then, um, so I knew I had to do my 300 hour and um, this year or last year, yeah. um, 
February of 2022, I did my 300 hours. So that was a whole month mm. intensive. Wow. And um, I think we had two days off. <laughs> Good Lord. Uh, it was really fun, though. I like that style. We'll talk more about that mm-hmm. later. Definitely. And then um, I had an opportunity because I already had a background in teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, usually that's the hardest part. You know, the, the new instructors will learn the content, but they don't have the teaching skill yet. And I already had a choreography background. Um, I've always been a mentor for young women. And since 2004, I had been teaching all aspects of um, being a public speaker, um, as I said, choreography and dance and staging. Mm-hmm. And so I was comfortable directing people with how to move their body totally. or anything else. Yeah, you had a lot of transferable skills from your yeah. previous kind of life and, and what you were doing. Yeah, and so the... Um, the owner just happened to be at the tail end of my 300 hour training and saw that. Okay. And when there was an opportunity the very next month, I was sent to teach um, at my first uh, teacher training mm-hmm. in March in Hawaii. Oh, right. Back yeah. to Hawaii. Yeah, back right, to right Hawaii. <laughs> and, uh, and it was beautiful. It was such a great experience. Um, again, intensive. 17 day, 200 hours. Wow. Um, and then, um, yeah. And then I just became a teacher trainer for all of 2022. I, I did only four teacher trainings, uh, but I also went back and took, um, our Kundalini focused Mm. Hatha Vinyasa, uh, teacher training. So it was another 200 hour that I didn't need, but I wanted to learn about the Kundalini style. Right. Yeah. And that was so, um, so beautiful, a great experience as well. And then um, the last training I did was in November, okay. also in Hawaii, All right. yeah. <laughs> the first and the last. Um, and I'm not sure if teaching for a school at this time is exactly what I want to do. And we can talk about why later, mm-hmm. um, but that's really it. I, I, I learned what I needed to learn at the moment right. for uh, teaching for a school. Uh, I'm very inspired to create my own school mm. and... Um, I'm that, that's the way I am. If I, if I'm a part of something and I see room for improvement, I'm not the type of person that will go right to the higher powers that be and say, Hey, this is wrong. You guys have to fix it. Right. I think to myself, what can I do to, um, help improve this situation? There you go. And that's why I ended up in the pageant world. I did a pageant and I thought, what could I do to make the pageant experience better for the contestants? And then I became part of the team for production and part of um, choreography and backstage Mm. and and just making sure that people have a great experience. So I see a different way to hold a school and to prepare people for what they're going to enter uh, for a teacher training. And so I'm really inspired to do that. It takes a lot of time to get your own school accredited. So for now, I'm just happy, not just, I'm very happy. (laughs) We talked about that. I'm extremely happy creating retreats, creating retreats that have optional workshops and continuing education options for teachers um, and even programs for children. Because I Mm. think the earlier we start, the better in this type of, of learning and teaching. Yeah, most definitely. Wow. Great. I love that. You've got a great history with this. Thank you. And I think, you know, want to touch on the uh, the transferable skills part, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I think uh, a lot of us don't realize how many skills we have going into the new thing we're going into. And yeah, that new thing might be kind of scary and it is new, but you have a lot of skills that you have from your previous, just whatever life you've lived mm-hmm. that can transfer over into this new stuff. And that's beautiful, right? Then we don't have to recreate the entire wheel. We can draw on some of those experiences that we've had to kind of get that confidence when we're stepping into this new kind of unfamiliar realm. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things for me is, um, uh, you know, that, that was also to speak to that was in my previous life, I was a corporate trainer. I was, uh, you know, a manager of restaurants, a manager of staff to held all this kind of like meetings and all this stuff. Right. So the, the holding space side for me wasn't the hard part. It was, I was fine. Like I can stand up at any point in time and just wax about whatever kind of weird topic <laughs> that pops into my head. I feel comfortable doing that. No problem. Uh, the part for me was, um, the actual physicalness of the yoga. And that was, um, 
that, you know, when I first started taking yoga, I, I, I knew I fell in love with it right away. I was like, this is my, this is my shit. I, mm -hmm. I don't know where this has been my entire life. I apologized to my girlfriend for two years for trying to get me to go and telling her no. And then I finally <laughs> went and she couldn't get me away from that damn place. But I knew for myself, like I wanted to experience the practice of yoga for at least five years before I stepped into the teaching realm, just to get an understanding. And that was my own personal thing. That's not like I'd, I'm not going to tell anybody that there's a certain time frame before you have to, you know, figure out if you're going to teach yoga. Um, but for me, it was five years. There was a, a gentleman that I did a, um, a teacher training with, um, probably the second or third teacher training I did that had never taken a yoga class before, never at all. Um, had barely even understood what yoga was, but his journey was that he was going to prison and he wanted to go in there with the skill that he could help people with. Mm -hmm. And so he decided he wanted to do yoga and went to his teacher training, got his teacher training, went to jail. I saw him maybe two years ago. So he's out mm -hmm. and he had a beautiful experience. He was able to do, join the yoga behind bars program and start teaching in, in, uh, in the jails mm -hmm. and was a beautiful experience for him. So, <clears throat> you know, I did just to recap, like, it, there's no time frame. Like if you have the passion, follow the passion, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, one other thing I want to mention before we keep diving in is uh, when we get to styles, and we've already talked about two styles that are little, um, there's some uh, controversy around. So mm -hmm. Baptiste and, and Baron Baptiste and, and Bikram. Um, and so you'll hear us talk about these styles. Um, that doesn't mean we agree with what um, has been said or accused of those people. Um, the, uh, I think the, the biggest message that I've gotten out of talking from people, uh, in deep, deeply with people from both camps, um, that have both positive and disparaging things to say about those folks is that you can have <clears throat> a bad, and I've used the word bad, quote unquote, bad, um, teacher, mentor, right? But the content can still be good. The experiences can still be good. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've met many people that have been personally um, abused and hurt by Bikram, but I've also met people that have had their life changed from that style of yoga. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so again, I'm not saying that go take their trainings, don't go take their trainings, but listen to your body, listen to what's being said to you, listen to how this information reason, re, you know, re, uh, relates back to you. And then you make those decisions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, you'll hear us talk about, and we'll share our opinions because we do have opinions about it. Uh, but it's up to you to make the decision where you lie with that stuff. Okay. Um, so for teacher trainings in general, there are so many out there. There's so many styles. There's so many combinations. There's destination, there's local. Uh, we talked about 200 hour versus 500 hour. Um, We'll talk about the the, the uh, reasonings for those different levels, uh, but then we also have like combination trainings, right? You can take a solo, let's say Hatha training, and Hatha is what in Northwest we call the shortened version of Bikram, the sixty minute Bikram, because people don't like to use his name up here. Mm -hmm. um, there's Vinyasa, there's Yin, there's Iyengar, there's Kundalini. Now there's Booty, there's Sculpt, there's all these different types of certifications that we can get to amass into our teaching tool bag. Um, where do we start? You know, we're, we're you know, with all that information out there and all the different options out there, in your opinion, as been doing this for a little while, um, what would you recommend somebody that's like pretty new to yoga, very excited about teaching, you know, what, what would that kind of journey sound like, kind of look like for you? I think with all things and all decisions, you have to ask your why first, mm -hmm. like, why do you want to do this? why are you driven to take a teacher training? Is mm -hmm. it because you want to be a teacher? Is it because you want to deepen your own practice? Is it um, because you're so inspired by the teachers that you've taken classes from that, you know, you just want to be that inspiration for somebody else? Whatever your why is, great. Follow the path of your why. Um, when it comes to what type and what style, I didn't know really anything about that until I took my first 200 hours. So you don't, it depends, right? If you, if you're very clear on what style you enjoy and resonates most with you, I would say go for that first, but be open to others. Mm -hmm. Um, choosing one specific style can make you a great specialist, right. But then you may not get as many opportunities to teach because not every studio wants every style. Right. Like I took that Kundalini course and there's nowhere that I know of in my immediate area where I can teach a Kundalini class. Um, so really, um, I, I would say 
where, who do you look up to? If it's because you look up to somebody, where did they learn? Mm. What, where did they go? Yep. And just, you know, start there. Um, and then again, if you want to teach or if you want to deepen your practice, there are different options. I think um, there are some people that go to teacher training also expecting kind of a retreat yeah. in, instead of a teacher training. And they, work? Think, <laughs> and they think they're going to learn um, and retreat, but it's one kind of or the other. Right. You know, the, the style that I've been to and I've taught has always been the intensive, immersive mm -hmm. uh, teaching experiences where you barely get a day off in two and a half weeks. Right. And, um, and I think that's effective when, um, when for somebody like me, if I were to draw it out over a few weeks or a couple months, mm -hmm. I would lose my place in the book, so to speak. Okay. And I like to keep the momentum going and just tune everything out. I know that this is my time to learn this specific thing that I've taken this amount of time out of my personal life. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it was easy for me to just let everything go and go deep into this. Right. Now, not everybody can do that. Right. And there are people often on their phones during class or on their phones during every break. So who are you there for? Right. Yeah. Right. Can you, can you commit to the program? So then that's the other question is how much time do you have to commit? What's your learning style? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the once you know how much time you have to commit and your learning style, if you want to do it immersive and intensive or if you want to do it more drawn out, then you'll start to see what's available. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do it local or do you want to do it far away? And then you just kind of have to pick what resonates most with you. And unfortunately, anybody can write anything right. <laughs> on a website. Anyone can present anything through beautiful marketing but that's not always going to be what you show up to. Right. So it's also like you have to find a way to find people who have been to that school. If you're really um, investing a lot of time and money and effort, which every teacher training that I it's know requires all of that. Yes. Um, and f do a little bit of research. Don't just pick something off the whim because the pictures look nice and the description on the website seemed cool. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. I uh, and, and to kind of echo what you were talking about with the lineage idea is one of the things that, that, that really helped me was talking to the teacher trainers, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so making concept, once you find that one that you, you, you feel drawn to see if there's a contact, right? E email that person, call that person, you know, the, um, I'm a heavily tattooed man. Right. And one of the best advice I ever got when I started getting my tattoos is make sure that you can sit with that person for five hours and have him carve on you or have them carve on you mm -hmm. and not be upset with them, not be annoyed with them, still feel generally, genuinely and, and embraced in their conversation and in mm -hmm. their presence. And same thing with yoga teacher trainings. Like there's so many different types of styles out there that we talked about. We'll talk about deeper. There's so many different approaches to those styles that if your teacher isn't meeting your needs, then you're never going to get the information that you need, right? Mm -hmm. So having a conversation with the teacher trainings, making sure that your morals and your values align with that person, making sure that you can understand the, the teaching style that they have. Um, when I went through teacher training, um, and I had, I had a beautiful experience and I loved the, the trainer that, that taught me, you know, so there is definitely like a relationship that you have with that person. Um, whether you want to label that person, the teacher or guru, whatever you want to call them. Right. Um, but that's a relationship that needs to be fostered and, and nurtured. And by no means am I saying like they need to placate to all of your needs, but they should still challenge you. They'll mm -hmm. still like probably not be your best friend, but also, shouldn't make you cry every single moment that they, that they talk to you. Right? right. Right. So like having that opportunity to talk to those folks. Yeah. I, I think if, so thinking about the type of school that I would create also, mm -hmm. um, I would very much love to allow the prospective students to speak with the instructors and the teachers right. and have a sort of, um, kind of a, even if it's virtual, like a virtual open house so that students can all come together, p potential students can come together and have these questions that they probably all have, right? Mm -hmm. And share Q&A with teachers and past, even past graduates of the school. Yeah, um, That's the way to be transparent, to, yeah. to open up and say, hey, we're not trying to like 
we think our school is amazing, but let, why don't you hear it from the people that teach for us and the people that have already graduated? Yeah, definitely. One of the um, one of the things, and and uh, there's a when I when I started getting out of management about five six years ago in in, in corporate world, there was a new buzz term <clears throat> buzz term called a uh, horizontal management. Mm. And basically, it meant that um, although I am the manager. It doesn't mean that I am the decision maker, the, the, the rights holder, like I'm not the authoritative figure. I just have a little bit more responsibility than y'all do. We're going to make decisions mutually, right? Mm -hmm. We're all going to talk about the decisions that we're making and we're going to make them together. So we feel like we're all part of that team. Um, and some of the best teacher trainings that I've witnessed have had a very similar kind of approach to where it's not like I'm the teacher do what the fuck I tell you to, because I have the knowledge, which there are some teaching tra teacher training programs out there like that. <laughs> that doesn't work for me at all. Mm -hmm. That does not right. work for me at all. Nobody holds all the information. Nobody holds all the knowledge. There are definitely teachers and they have that knowledge and they have that label because they have a little bit more of an understanding of maybe what the information is they're trying to get out there. But the best conversations happen when that information is challenged, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And not in a disparaging way, but the, the whys. Why do we do it like that? Don't, don't ask why, just do it because I told you, your knee's on top of your ankle every time in Warrior Two, no matter what. <laughs> if my hips are really tight, maybe my knee's going to be a little bit behind my ankle, right? Yeah. Maybe it's going right. to be a little in front. But, you know, where is the, there's the, the, the absoluteness? needs to go away. Right? right. And so like, that's, that's one of those things that, that again, having the relationship, having a, a conversation with the, the people that are doing your training can give you an understanding of like what that looks like for you. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think of, uh, being challenged. My first experience as a teacher trainer, uh -huh. <laughs> there was a brilliant scientist that was a student <laughs> and she had so many, she was a Harvard scholar. She had so many questions, wow. so many precise questions. And I thought, wow, I'm so lucky that she's at my first teacher training because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be able to answer so many more questions now. That's great. And when I didn't know the answer, I didn't pretend to know. Mm. I said, hey, let's let's uh, look it up or the other instructor was there and I would say, Hey, you know, Megan, help me yeah. unpack this. Yep. You know, we don't know everything. Yes. I think everyone is a student and I think I've grown more, I would say as a teacher at a teacher training mm -hmm. than as a student. Cause as a student, a lot of it was like, Okay, I know that pose. I know what to do to at the two hundred hour level. Right. Well, let me be specific. <laughs> there, it was more like, well, I did all my homework. I know all the poses. I studied all the books. I'm ready. I'm comfortable telling people how to move their body. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't until we really got into more philo philo philosophical uh, conversation and the history of yoga that then I was like, yes, okay, I'm learning new stuff. Yeah. Um, but this, you know, working with different types of um students also just how they learn mm -hmm. um language barriers culture differences communication styles like all of those things play into we were talking earlier about all the skills that teachers need in yeah. order to be a part of teacher trainings mm -hmm. and um and i've had so many diverse students it's been really a blessing to have all of that in one year yeah um I keep telling people it feels like I lived five years in 2022. <laughs> so much happened, yeah. like so much. And and it's so awesome just to continue to grow through the experience of, of teaching and learning yoga. Yeah, most definitely. I think one of the, the things that you mentioned just now that I think is one of the biggest, most important things is to, uh, to admit when we don't know. Mm -hmm. And what that does for me is that humanizes the teacher. Um, you know, a lot of times we as teachers or anybody in authoritative kind of position is, has the opportunity to be looked up to mm -hmm. have the power, right? That idea of power and that, that, you know, I'm the information holder, but when we can, when we can humanize ourselves and say, you know what, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Let's find out together. It takes us down to that level that we should be at in the first place. Eye mm -hmm. to eye with our <laughs> students, not looking down from the above, you know, we're right there with them so we can learn together, you know, and because, you know, we, you know, especially as a parent, like I'm a parent, I have two kids, right? There's very, for a long time, my kid looked up to me as I was the, the, the knower of the knowledge. I had all the answers and shit. And it was very, 
very uh, <laughs> beneficial for me to finally humanize myself with my kids and let them see that I'm just an idiot just like them. Yeah. We're all figuring this out together. <laughs> I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to fall on my face. I'm going to say the wrong thing. But, hey, you know, it's, it's all done from the best place, and we'll, we'll figure it out once we get there. Mm-hmm. You know, and so having a, having a teacher is, uh, that, that has that humanistic skill is, is really important for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with, um, um, so let's, before we get into the, the length of teacher trainings, let's talk about the different styles, <clears throat> um, or the combination of styles, mm-hmm. right? So we don't want to go through all the different styles because there's so many <laughs> so styles many. of yoga to go through. Yeah. Uh, but there are, uh, specialized, uh, so first off, let's say the 200 hour teacher training is the most standardized entry level. You need this to teach. You mm-hmm. need this to, to feel safe, to understand the knowledge. So there's a 200 hour teacher training. Um, now with that 200 hours, you can do a solo teacher training you can do like a vinyasa or a Baptiste or a Hatha or a Bikram or, mm-hmm. you know, individual trainings. Yin. um, you can also stack them and mm-hmm. that's very popular in the Northwest. Um, I, I, I've seen a lot of that in the other areas of the world too, but I'm just more familiar with the Northwest and you'll see the teacher trainings we used to do, uh, when I was with open up were, um, stacking vinyasa, Hatha and Yin. Mm-hmm. Right. So we do basically a hundred hours or about 60 hours of a Hatha, 60 hours of Vinyasa, uh, fill in with Yin. And then we have the practicum in, in between. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are benefits for stacking. There's also, um, things to look out for with that stuff. So with your experience, um, what are some of those benefits? We'll start with the benefits of kind of stacking the styles in there. Well, I've only experienced stacking Hatha Vinyasa. Okay. And, um, I would say, the benefits are just being able to offer more than one style, um, understanding um, your av- av- ability to also make a creative flow where it's uh, kind of a fusion of both. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I would I will admit stacking confused me. Yeah, because my first year. I would say I can teach Hatha Vinyasa, but then I was like, I don't really know the difference (laughs) (laughs) because I did them both at the same time and there was never actually a distinction. This is Hatha, this is Vinyasa until I was teaching Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And then I said, okay, yes, okay, so... Sun side, moon side, hatha, mm-hmm. you know, and then you start learning more of the terms and then vinyasa was flow with breath and, um, like, well, you always flow with your breath <laughs> <laughs> and hatha just means yoga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I would say it's actually confusing, mm. uh, for those two, for me specifically, um, which helped me when I went to teacher trainings to be very specific on like this is Hatha, this is Vinyasa. Very delineated yes. between the two, yeah. And even in their final practicum, they were required to do elements of both, but not a full of one. Oh, interesting. So, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, um, I would, I, the benefits, maybe you can speak a little bit more, more to yeah. stacking. I, so the, yeah, so the benefits we kind of mentioned earlier, um, knowing how to teach more than one style is going to give you more ability to get out there and teach if mm-hmm. that's what your gig is, if you're wanting to deepen your practice. Um, if, if you're wanting to deepen your practice, I'd say stick to one. Right, mm-hmm. learn one, move to the next one because that's the depth of the practice that you're learning. If you want to teach it, then that's a whole other story. Mm-hmm. Um, so the benefits that I saw with that are yes, you get you get multiple levels, you get multiple ideas of what you're teaching. Um, it's uh, it can give you more of a well-rounded understanding, especially um, like if you know the difference between hatha and vinyasa. Right, hatha uh, Bikram style up here is, you know, you do a posture, then you stop that posture, then you do another posture and you stop that posture. Uh, Vinyasa, like you said, more flow with breath. Um, So if you have an understanding of what that delineation is between the two, then that can be very beneficial because you understand like the difference between those two styles. But if, if you're brand new to yoga and you take a stacked teacher training, I've saw it so many times, the confusion on people's faces, because like, just take the verbiage, for example, like we call, um, in, in a Hatha, we have a triangle pose, right? Mm-hmm. But that Hatha pose and triangle looks very similar to a side angle in Vinyasa. And so when you start to mm-hmm. combine and confuse, like what the verbiage is between, okay, so this practice is called this, but this practice is called that that's when the head shaking starts to get there and they're like, wait a minute, wait, it's the same thing. Right. But why is it different? You know? Mm -hmm. So, so there is some, some difficulty with that. 
And so with speaking to the difficulties of, um, the thing that I saw the most is if you stack too much, you rush too much Mm -hmm. again. So, but the stacking side, like there is definitely benefits to stacking, but once you start to get more, um, specialized, the stacking kind of gets in the way, Mm -hmm. right? Especially like something like Kundalini, like you were talking about earlier. Kundalini is a very individualized yoga practice. Like it's very different than any of the other ones. So if you learn Kundalini with vinyasa, there's a lot of confusing things that'll happen between those two that might contradict each other pretty strongly yeah, too. I, yeah, actually the experience that I had, it was the first time the school offered a Kundalini in person. Um, they've done it online, which I think um, was going well for them. So uh, they did it in person and there was that requirement to, because it's through Yoga Alliance, they had right. to, they had to stack it because there is no Yoga Alliance Kundalini certification. Okay. <laughs> so they had to stack it with Hatha and Vinyasa. Okay. And then the people that were there for Kundalini, they were like, I don't ever want to do a sun salutation. Right. We're like, well, if you want your certificate, <laughs> you have to right. learn it yeah. and do it and teach it yeah. and love it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that smile, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that was a, the first big like, oh, wow, this is this isn't what I thought I was signing up for yeah. either. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, stacking, don't ever set Kundalini. Don't ever, I'm just going to say this. Don't go to anything that's stacked with Kundalini. Like yeah. Kundalini is its own beautiful thing. It really is. Um, and yes, the Hatha Vinyasa, I would say, I think if I were to have taken it the way you guys taught it, where it was Hatha first, then Vinyasa, that would have helped my brain. Right. Um, yin is something that we didn't touch into until our 300 hour. Okay. And then, um, but I did see, I was very tempted to take one of those 100 hour weekend or four weekend things Mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but I didn't until I went to uh, the 300 hour and even yin stacked with anything. Yin calls every pose something different because it's more peaceful to call something a swan than a pigeon. Exactly. exactly. (laughs) Sleeping swan looks a lot like half pigeon. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I think terminology, just just even just that, because yeah. you don't want to get twisted with your words when you're instructing. Yeah. It's already enough that you're sometimes facing your students and you say left instead of right or right instead of left or you forget a side, you know. Uh-huh. Now you're now you're going to have to work on, okay, what, what style am I teaching? What do we call it here? Mm-hmm. That's too many... Too many things, things going, going on. on in the brain. Yep, totally. Yeah. And you know, to my uh, to my previous statement about the stacking, uh, I found stacking works more effectively if you have a spread out teacher training, mm-hmm. not an intensive. Yeah. With that, like you said, seventeen days or two weeks in a row or whatever that time frame is, that's a lot of time you're dedicating to your learning process. And if you're moving through a lot of information and you're combining yoga styles and different terminologies. There's a lot of that in one ear, out the other thing going on there. And we don't have a lot of time to retain that information. Mm -hmm. So my personal best way of looking at that is if you have the time and you want multiple styles, do a long extended training. Mm -hmm. You know, there's trainings out there that are like um, one weekend a month, right? So it's like eight months. There's trainings out there that are every weekend, right? So you have the time in the week to kind of digest the information, mm-hmm. understand it, and then go back into your training in the weekend. Mm-hmm. Those are the best ways that I found to stack the styles. But if you're going to do, if you have an intensive and that's all the time you have, choose a style and mm-hmm. really dive into that one. Yeah. I My agree. best advice. I agree. I agree yeah. with that. So now we, we move on to the different lengths of trainings. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have the 200 hour teacher training, which is again, the most standardized to get your accreditation, um, to get your, your foot in the door, start teaching in a place. Um, and then we have the extended, uh, teacher trainings, which you can, if you have a, th- a 200 hour originally, you can get a 300 hour to make that 500 hours, mm-hmm. or you could just dive right in and do a 500 hour teacher training. Um, and that 500 hour gives you that ability to start teaching yoga to teachers, mm-hmm. right? And it gives you a little bit more of that, um, that knowledge base so that you can hold the space and share the knowledge to the people that are learning to teach yoga now, not mm-hmm. the people that are, are there to, uh, 
uh, explore their practices. Yes. Right. Um, and so, and then we have the YSEP hours, which you're talking about, which mm-hmm. you're, you know, <laughs> taking care of now, which is great. Yes. And those are those kind of fill in, right? So we can fill in, but we can also use the YSEPs, if I'm not mistaken, in some ways we can use that to fill in a 500 hour teacher training in some uh, yes. like places like twist down in uh, Seattle, mm-hmm. like they have three locations now. Um, and some teacher training programs, like you can, uh, if you wanted to do that 500 hour or get the 300 hours to complete your 500 hour, um, like I was saying, twist, um, they have their own programs that you can take different types of modules from all their teachers, but then they also work with certain other schools throughout the Seattle area mm-hmm. so that you can get accreditations from different types of teachers, not only the twist teachers. And I love that. I like that. I like that a lot yeah. because then it's like, well, I really want to learn from Jason Crandall down in San Francisco because he's got great body movement anatomy Mm -hmm. but he's not up here in washington but if i go to twist then twist is covering jason crandall's accreditation because he's fucking awesome so yeah that (laughs) my 50 hours can now go towards my twist 500 hour right so there's different ways that we can build these ideas um so starting with the 200 hour and we kind of talked about the different time frames but uh we can do an intensive which Mm -hmm. is basically 200 hours of of work you're doing within Mm -hmm. that time that it takes Mm -hmm. to do 200 hours of work. And that can be great for people that have like two weeks off of work every year, or that can take long periods of time off and just Mm -hmm. dedicate them times their time to that. Um, and then there's spread out variations. Mm -hmm. We talked about uh, weekends. We talked about one weekend a month online. Now there's all Mm -hmm. different types. So with the 200 hour, um, you've said that you've worked mainly with the intensives. Yes. And so talk to me about that. Like how did that benefit you in, in your kind of journey? Uh, with the intensive, they encourage pre-arrival homework okay. so that you are already familiar with the book. I highly encourage that. Same. Um, <laughs> I did my 200 hour a little bit different than my 300. My 300, I read as much of all the books. I had eight books. <laughs> I read as much of all of them as possible. And my 200 hour, I glanced and I started just taking notes slowly. Yeah. And I found myself with a lot of homework <sighs> every night. And I was a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say stressed, but I felt pressed. Mm. Um, like I didn't have enough time to just breathe into the knowledge that we were shared through discussion even. I right. was just always like anticipating I need time to finish my homework. <laughs> um, so that is also a thing. Like having assigned homework every day. Um, and then discussing homework every day just to make sure that everyone's on the same pace. So there are markers to track that everyone knows and and is following Mm -hmm. because it is so intensive. And, um, there's a lot of repetition of things that are important to, to memorize, to learn, to really embody as a teacher. Um, there's a lot of uh, the hard stuff like anatomy, I say hard because it's not always fun right. to, yeah. to like sit through and learn all the types of joints, the types of muscles, the way things move, the directions of the spine, all that stuff. You don't often use anatom- anatomical descriptions because most people that you're teaching aren't familiar with all the exact words. Totally. Um, but it is something that you're still required to learn. That's probably the hardest part for people to get through. Yeah. And they just want to do asana labs or something right. where they're learning the pose and figuring out their own alignment. That's the other thing. As a teacher, you will, um, as as I instruct, is if you're going to do the pose, do the pose with proper alignment mm-hmm. so that any student that may be looking at you is not being misled. Right. And so... Um, having your own body awareness is a whole other layer to this. Uh, It's not just knowing how to tell everybody, but if you're going to participate in the class as well as teach, you want to participate in a way that's safe, in Mm -hmm. a way that's aligned. So you're learning lots of safety, lots of anatomy, body placement, and then having the courage to tell somebody what to do with their body. Right. Not everybody is comfortable with that. And uh, that's, you know, people get tongue twisted oh, when gosh. they try to say even, you know, inhale your arms up, stand tall, right? Yeah. And, and the simple cue, but it's not something we walk around doing all day, every day. Not everybody does. Until you start teaching and then that's all I do. <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you how many times like I drove to, when I was doing my teacher training program, I was uh, working in Portland and living up here in Washington. And so once a week I would drive down to Portland for three days and then drive back. 
and it's about three hour drive to Portland. And so I got three Hatha sessions dialogue in every drive <laughs> to Portland and then three sessions back. Cause I would just sit there and go over my dialogue, inhale, circle, sweep the arms high, interlace your fingers, release your pointer finger, biceps back by the ears, root the heels, inhale, lengthen, exhale, pull off to the right half moon. Right. And then just like keep going through that dialogue. But it. until I got to that point, like I was like, ah, I just thinking about my thoughts. And then as soon as teacher training happened, Boom. There you go, all that dialogue. That's all I did was walk yeah. around saying that shit. <laughs> and you know, even what you just said, I love um, I love hearing other people cueing. Yeah. Um, because one of my fortes is um, high vibrational cueing mm. and direct cueing. So I I listen very carefully now. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I just love how precise and concise you were with your instruction. <laughs> and it, there was no doubt. Even though you said it really fast, right. I'm like, <laughs> I got it, I got it, I got it, you know. Yeah. And... Um, um, that is also a skill to learn. Uh, there's so many people using filler words because they're trying to think. Right. And they say, okay, so now we're going to bring our arms all the way in. It's like you've already said 12 words and you still haven't given them the direction. Yes. Or the breath. Like, tell me the damn pose, man. Yeah, tell me the damn yeah, pose. Yeah, and the pose. Yep. You know, there's so many different things. So it's not just showing up. At a, you know, I had the blessing of being in beautiful beachy locations. Oh yeah. So, yeah. and it's, and even, even that is like, do I want my school to have a beach or like, do I want to teach at a beach location? And part of me doesn't because when you have pictures and you tell people the teacher, this 200 hour teacher training is in Hawaii next to the black sand beach, which it was, yeah. you know, they say, Oh, cool. I, it's a long, it's, it seems hard. It seems like intense and, you know, it's a lot of work, but I'm right by the beach so I can just go chill anytime. Right. You can't chill. Yeah, there's no chill time. <laughs> you can't yes. chill because you got homework. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You, got shit you to can't do. chill because you have practice teaching. Uh -huh. You know, there's, there's a lot of that too. Every day you're going to practice teach every yeah. single day. And, um, it's a lot. It's a, it's fun if you are open to that kind of fun. Right. Uh, for me, it's fun on either end of the training. Um, but for some people, you know, it's even, even the time in your own journey in life, you might have been a student 20, 30 years ago, and all of a sudden you want to learn yoga. Mm -hmm. Just know that even being a student for the first time in even 10 years, it's going to be hard. Yeah. So I find there was a lot of challenges with people in, in their later decades where, you know, it's been a while since they taught. They have this idea of how everything should run in their life because they've mastered that for themselves. Yeah. And they show up at a place where they're not in control only of what they learn right. and how they react to what they're learning but they're not in control of the environment. They're not in control of the curriculum mm -hmm. and how fast we actually need to teach. And so sometimes it's hard for the um, for people to keep up with the pace of learning. Right. Um, so know that if you're out there considering taking an intensive, I think it's super fun. For some people, it's really hard. Yeah. Uh, because it's fast, and yeah. and they haven't learned something in a long time. Yep. And you know, in a way that to me is the uh, the the that old adage we we use all the time: yoga off the mat. Mm -hmm. Right. That's where the yoga off the mat starts to happen, where you're listening to yourself, you're honoring your where you're at, you're honoring where you're your strengths lie, you're honoring where your quote unquote weaknesses, perceived weaknesses lie and working with all of that, right? Mm -hmm. That's your constitution. That's how we show up. And when mm -hmm. we're aware of that, then we can be prepared for it and right. we're ready to take on that workload and to cumbersomely, awkwardly be a student again, mm -hmm. right? We haven't done that because yeah, to your point, when I went through my teacher training, I had been out of school, everything for about two decades. Mm -hmm. And like, <laughs> even though I was teaching people, I wasn't really learning in that kind of aspect. I was learning through books, through seminars and stuff like that. But I didn't sit down and say, hey, you're going to have 200 hours of shit you need to memorize yeah. and figure out. And then that's just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh shit, here we go. Now we're doing this, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My, um, the, the real reason why I chose to do an intensive for my 200 hours, because my last, what would have been my last single year of engineering school, I was already working full time at Boeing and, um, I went 
and they have this continuing education program. So I was able, as long as I stayed full time to Mm -hmm. get tuition paid by them. Oh yeah. And, um, I don't know if that program still exists, but I'm thankful it did when I was going through school and it took my last very full year of engineering school. And it took me four years to complete it because I was a full time employee and then going to school And, you know, it was the commute, Mm -hmm. the learning, and then trying to retain it, but then going to work and doing the thing. (laughs) And I just knew that if I were to invest as much as I was investing in um, the teacher training, that I could only do that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I had to do the intensive. And I'm so glad that I did. Um, It was so easy for me to just shut everything out, took the time off of work. I closed all my projects. Like I just knew yeah. I was there for me and some people need that. Yeah. yeah. Um, other people are great at being able to retain knowledge and all of that. I also wasn't a huge reader. Mm-hmm. Now I, I'm like excited to read 20 books this year. Happy like reader. I have so many, <laughs> so many things I want to read. Um, yeah. So yeah, just, just being mindful of, of your learning style, what you really need. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you really want to be on a beach at some point, go to a retreat. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) There are definitely retreat styles and you can lean into that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. So for 500 hour, so, so somebody put this to me, um, uh, when I first started my teacher training journey, um, and said basically like your 200 hour is more or less like your bachelor's degree. And then your 500 hour is where your master's is, right? That's where you start to dive in really deep on the stuff that makes you excited. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I love about the 500 hour. I haven't done, I have an honorary 500 hour. I haven't done an actual 500 hour. Um, I've taken, you know, countless, uh, YSEP courses and all that stuff, but I've kind of moved away from my desire to get a 500 hour. Um, that's just personal decision. It mm-hmm. might happen one day, but uh, there's just so many other cool things that I've kind of ventured into yeah. that are outside of the yoga realm, um, that still tie into it in a way, but just aren't part of any curriculum. Um, and, uh, but the 500 hour is that opportunity for you or the 300 hour com- combined is that opportunity for you to dive into those nuances that you might have found passions when your 200 hour was happening. Mm-hmm. So like you were talking about anatomy, like anatomy might be the thing of like, holy shit, like ligaments and tendons, who would have known? Yeah. Like I'm jazzed about that shit. And right. You can do a hundred hour YSEP for that and just, <laughs> you know, put that towards your, your 500 hour teacher yeah. training. Uh, you can get deeper into the philosophy of yoga. You can get deeper into the asanas, you know, mm-hmm. all these different realms that you can deepen your, your idea in to get you more, uh, specialized if you want that specialization, but also it's one of those things that even though you have your 500 hour, you can still continue to take these courses and continue to build your knowledge base. And, uh, so for your 500 hour, when you got that combined 300 for your 500 Mm -hmm. and you said you did that an intensive also, it was intensive. It was February 1st to the 28th, the whole month. Holy crap. (laughs) Wow. Two days off. Yeah. Two days Man, off. that is crazy. It was so fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, once you're, well, I, mean, I guess if you, if you figure out you're a good learner oh. and a good student, then dive into that. I just, it, uh, it's, it is my retreat, right? So learning and being in the stuff that I love without any, I get, I would say without any other responsibilities, because mm-hmm. you know, that's what you do when you go to these things. It's you're only responsible for yourself. That's my favorite kind of moment. Yeah. <laughs> I I had my uh, my fortieth birthday in the middle of it. All like right. it was so fun. Oh, it was yeah. just I was in the middle of doing everything that I loved and um, learning about the philosophy, which I was so curious about. Um, learning all the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, mm-hmm. reading the Bhagavad Gita. We did um, a Yin module. Mm-hmm. We did a, a prenatal. Oh, prenatal That's as well. Stuff. We did. Um, extensive work on um, yoga asanas and adjustments Mm. labs. So we took every single pose and we know how to adjust people in every single pose. That's so important. uh, Giving that support, which, um, you know, it wasn't until recently that we were able to do that again in, in, um, in studios. So I was really excited to like really come back with that. That was the course that, um, taught us about high vibrational language as well. And just like bringing 
a good feeling to the words that people hear from you, no matter what it is that you're communicating. Mm, yeah. Um, we learned about the power of gratitude. So there's the school uh, that I learned from and worked for is a spiritual and mystical school. So, oh, cool. So we do lots of fun. Everyone had to do a ritual or a ceremony. Mm. We always did... Um, full moon, new moon ceremonies. So those are really fun things that I don't really know what other schools do because yeah. I'm just, that's, you, that's what you've done. That's all I know. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually curious also to see what other schools are, are, are offering yeah. and, um, and how I would feel if that would align, um, with the way that I, I love to teach. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of creative freedom, um, in the school that I was teaching with where we would be able to offer those fun workshops and maybe we talk about aromatherapy Mm -hmm. or maybe we talk about, um, uh, crystals and, and moon energy and how to work with the moon energy for, uh, different parts of your life. A lot of times it's mostly women. So we also talk about moon energy in our feminine cycle Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, lots of conversation over what's, what can you, and can you not do? Yeah. Um, which, you know, I think everyone can, cannot do whatever they think they can and cannot do. Exactly. That, that, yeah, that's a very personal question to ask and answer. Um, so the, the 300 hour was really, it was really fun. Um, the morning asanas that we would have instead of the instructors leading, it would be the students because we already had our 200 hour. Mm -hmm. There was one difference the, where you could tell there was a student that, um, he had just completed the 200 hour, had one week off and then went into this 300 hour. So he was, uh, two months in the same location with one week off. And, you know, that was where you could tell the difference, um, between a few of us that had already been teachers for years and mm-hmm. then someone who had just learned a week prior. Right. There's a little, you, you need that integration time, I would say, unless it is a full combined, um, experience right. where everyone is starting from zero hours to 500. Um, Hopping from a 200 to a 300 because it fits the schedule, it might have a different intention for the 300 hour portion of it. Right. And, um, and that's where I did notice just a big difference in the students and then that person's, um, comfortability, even, right. even teaching us. Yeah. I think that, that integration side is a huge, important one. And kind of to speak to what you were talking about earlier about, you know, if we haven't been a student in a while, really take a look at, can you, can you physically and mentally absorb that much information in that amount of time and, and, and reliably regurgitate it, Mm -hmm. you know, with confidence, with, with stature and granted, everything takes time. We we build confidence as we start to use the information that we have, but yeah, going from just one to the next, there's, there's there's that integration time. Like we need that. We need that breath. We need that time to like work with the knowledge that we've just gained, you yeah. know, in my opinion. And that's, again, that's the way that I work as a person. Yeah. I'm really glad that I did my 200 hour, had two years and then did my 300. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that I would even continue as a student yeah. after my 200 hour, but then just something clicked in 2020 and I thought I need to know more so that I can teach teachers. There you go. Um, And, you know, that's really, I think, unless it was to deepen my own practice and get deeper into the philosophy or because they were offering modules like yin Mm -hmm. and prenatal that I wanted to do anyway, why not pack it into one spot? Um, Those were things that I wanted to take individually and the fact that it was being offered in one uh, single place, one location, one time, um, one break from my life, it, it worked out. Um, but again, just at first I had no idea I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and had I known, I think I still would prefer to do it separately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. And, you know, in that hindsight, right. That mm-hmm. hindsight that we could always look back on, uh, with, um, now, so since you've both been through, you know, two types of teacher training, your 200 hour, your 300 hour, mm-hmm. and you facilitated on the facilitating side, many mm-hmm. teacher trainings, um, one of the things that I hear, and I've experienced it myself, um, but one of the things I kind of hear as not disparaging, but one of the things to kind of, I don't think a lot of uh, teacher trainers or programs have bad intentions with this by any means. I, I actually, I'll re- rephrase that. There's no bad intentions, I believe, with this style, but 
I think that sometimes we lack the support in some of the workshops that we do, Mm -hmm. uh, meaning mainly more towards the emotional side of the workshops. And so I've been a part of workshops where I've seen people be challenged with their constitution um, and brought to tears Mm. bullyingly in in a way. And then, but the teacher trainer justified it, right? And, um, and there's times where there's, you know, where we're saying, hey, we're going to have, we're going to talk about the vulnerability of our life, right? And get up there and somebody talks about vulnerability and has like emotional release and has maybe something come up that was triggered that they haven't thought about in a while. And then they have this big release around all these people, but there's not the therapy or the mm-hmm. therapeutic dialogue or the right support there to support that human being now that they've found that release. And now they're just a puddle of emotions in the corner trying to deal with it themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and so again, I don't think there's any bad intentions because that work for me has been beautiful, right? To feel that and to release that stuff. But having the support and the emotional guidance there to help make sure that that human is held, um, sometimes I feel is missed. Yeah. And that reminded me in the 500 or the 300 hour, Mm -hmm. uh, portion of my training, we also did trauma informed yoga. So we learned about that and triggers and how to manage, uh, those things with people. Um, and we also, this is not, uh, recognized by Yoga Alliance, but we also um, received Reiki for those who, mm. of us who wanted to become Reiki practitioners. Awesome. And so uh, we were able, we were given that. Um, and I think the combined um, just slight background of the uh, trauma-informed yoga, it's just trauma-informed. We're not like, we're not therapists. We're not right. able to like really treat anybody, but we learn how to hold that kind of space and um, bring comfort to people, mm-hmm. but not everyone's personality as an instructor or teacher was in alignment with that. Right. And there were people who were in tears and, and hurt by, um, an instructor. And, um, I wasn't always around <laughs> and it makes me sad to know that somebody is feeling upset for being open and vulnerable right. and not supported. Right. Um, 100%, um, of the time I come from a place of love and and passion for what I do and caring for others. And, um, I just always want to hold people in my (laughs) arms, you know, and I also recognize when it's not an actual physical holding with the arms that's needed, but rather, wow, I hear you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. You know, just even a thank you. That's so brave of you to share with us. Yes. Um, it's so important to have that awareness. And I think that is something that, um, people that are teaching, whether it's a yoga class or a teacher training should have some sort of background in that. I do feel like that should be part of curriculum, um, in understanding and and learning how to manage, uh, your reaction to people's, uh, vulnerability. Yes. Yeah. Cause it's vulnerability in another what I found about myself was it was triggering because mm-hmm. I'm, I, I want to be a fixer, right? And I'm, I'm very strong in that masculine kind of idea of like, Hey, you have a problem. I'm going I'm to help you fix it. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's have some ideas, but that's not always the thing that needs to be right. Sometimes, like you said, we just need to hold that space. We just need to be there to show support. And, um, so I guess what I'm really trying to say is that if you're, if, you, if emotional releases is part of your teacher training, which I'm not saying it shouldn't be because some of the best, the first emotional releases I had were in teacher training. Mm-hmm. Um, but just make sure you have support there. Make sure you have people there to support those people. So you have a separate room you can pull somebody aside to and let them be with their emotions mm-hmm. or some kind of guidance of whatever it is. Um, but too many times I've seen people be berated and you're not going deep enough cry harder. Yeah. You know, it's like, Oh, oh, oh man. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> be, be wary of what you're trying to ask the human to do. Yeah. I think that's important. And know when your students are ready for, for that level also, an example could be, um, a, you know, you're at a 200 hour class and you're just on day four and, um, your instructor decides that they want to put you through like this heart opening Kundalini, thing it could be very heart opening yeah and it could be very difficult well it happened at Mm. a teacher training that i was in and i wasn't there for the morning asana but i got a phone call hey i cracked them right open for your 
for your cacao ceremony later today. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, oh yeah, I got like four people crying. It's great. I'm like, I'm sorry. That's not, (laughs) that's not the intention. You have different definitions of the word great. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so, you know, something just like that, or like, you know, when we go through meditation module and teaching different methods of meditation, a lot of times um, we'll bring up the Osho um, Kundalini Osho shaking. And Mm -hmm. it's so, it's really, you know, for some people it's fun. A lot of people, it's a huge release. And anytime we do that, at least when I've been involved, we've always had at least two facilitators in the back corners, just like observing and holding space and being ready, um, to be there for anybody that's, that it's needed. So like that awareness is really important to have. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to backtrack just a little bit because with the the style the the length of teacher trainings, mm-hmm. there's one I left out, and that's one of the newer ones with COVID was online that uh-huh. got popularity. Um, yes. And I know a lot of us had to kind of shift to online, whether our teacher training programs we wanted to take was only available online. A lot of people finally found time to dedicate themselves to something, and we're like, hey, you know what? I got two weeks, so I can do a teacher training online. Let's do that. Um, with your experience. Um, where has, how has, how has online been received? So I have actually had two students in my 200 hour classes that have done online trainings Mm -hmm. and they came because they felt like they knew, but they wanted to know more. So, um, I think it's one of them had done a 500 hour online and the other one had done a 200 hour okay. online and they were both at this 200 hour intensive. Wow. So I can <laughs> kind of speak to the yeah. yeah. And and it's it's mostly them saying I think I need more. Right. And the things that I noticed most was just misalignment with the body. They were great teachers already. Um and then just, you know, shifting the language a little bit to be more precise and direct. Right. Um And really that was it. So they had the foundation, Mm -hmm. I think the practice and, and the, um, the body awareness that comes from having an in-person is really valuable, um, as a teacher and, uh, being able to have discussions with people. I don't really know how these online trainings are, are formed, um, but usually it's self-paced. So you're never live with a group and there might be you know, a group meeting or two. Yeah. Like one or two during the whole trainings. Yeah. Yeah. And so you don't get to even feel like 100% these online, uh, students did not have hands-on adjustments. They had no comfort, no comfortability doing it, performing Mm -hmm. it. And they were super glad they were in, uh, in uh, intensive in person training to be able to learn that. Yeah. So I think, um, I think it's great to get a foundation. I think it's great to deepen your own practice. I don't think it's the safest way to become a teacher for, um, and I say that for the safety of others. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, I, and I, I echo that a hundred percent. You know, there are definitely, if you have like a previous understanding of body movement, then, you know, maybe that could be what you need and you feel confident with that. But, um, after COVID, um, the, uh, you know, so I've been, haven't done teacher trainings in, a, in about four or five years now myself, but, you know, still actively teaching and mm-hmm. doing workshops and stuff. But I had probably at least a dozen people reach out to me that have gone through an online teacher training that are like, I don't feel ready yeah. or I just need, can I practice? Can I just, can you give me feedback? Mm-hmm. Right. Cause a lot of times what, what's happening is that, you know, they'll go through the program, they'll record themselves doing like a flow of sorts and then submit that and then get like a thumbs up back, but no actual dialogue or feedback saying, Hey, that's great. But you say the word I'm a lot. Right. And that's like you were talking about earlier. We had those filler words. Right. Everybody has them and now we're going to, and then, right, we all have them. And once we understand what they are, then we can start to work on getting them out of there. But if nobody tells you, you've just said, and then 37 times to cue one posture, mm-hmm. right? Then it's like, oh <laughs> shit. Okay. And then I'm never going to say, and then again, right. You know, so, but right. we need that kind of feedback. We need that kind of uh, in, in person idea of, Hey, this is what rotating your shoulders outwardly looks like, right? Mm-hmm. Protracting your scapula. This is exactly what that looks like. This isn't a diagram. This is my human body showing you that. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, there, there's a lot of that where I've had to kind of help clean up people's dialogue, their cueing, their room presence, right? Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times people are just standing on their mat and just dictating the class while they're doing it with them. 
okay, that's a way to do it. But are you going to be able to teach to an entire class when all you're doing is looking at your own mat, mm-hmm. right? What's the person in the back row that's never done a yoga class before doing? Are you keeping them safe? Mm-hmm. Right. So let's learn how to right. move around the room, right? Let's learn how to like do all the things, right? Yeah. So yeah, I, I kind of echo that. The, the online, it has its place, but I've, I've filled in a lot of gaps with, uh, yeah. with online trainings. Sounds like an opportunity for a CE. I, 100%. 100%. <laughs> and I just think it tap is. into those online teacher training companies and say, hey, I'd like to offer this CE for all of your graduates, and it's in person. <laughs> right. It's funny. I, I, you know, if, I, if I had caught, uh, stayed up with my Yoga Alliance and things like that, that was something Monica, my fiance, and I talked about doing mm-hmm. was having a, a YSEP program that's just filling in the gaps, like mm-hmm. Yoga 101, right? You know, yeah. Here's how to get you just comfortable getting into a room again, mm-hmm. you know? Know, but yeah, so hey, take it and run with it. Yeah, there's it a, I think there's a definitely <laughs> market for it, most definitely. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so last thing I really want to talk about as far as teacher trainings go before we just kind of dive into your thing real quick um, is Yoga Alliance. Um, and uh, I have kind of a jaded opinion of Yoga Alliance. Um, and I've, I don't know if that opinion has been planted uh, by others or if I actually am jaded by yoga alliance but it's been at least five years since i've had any kind of doings with them i stopped tracking hours i stopped doing all that shit through them um mainly because i never saw any benefit Mm -hmm. outside of getting accreditation for a school making sure that i hit x y and z uh but i never as a yoga teacher or as a yoga practitioner utilized yoga alliance for anything outside of tracking hours Mm -hmm. um and i'm not saying they don't do anything good i just haven't seen it so in your opinion, have you had workings with Yoga Alliance where you f- see the benefit of what they offer? Um, there are actual benefits okay. as a member. Okay. Um, there are discounts mm. that you okay. <laughs> that you get for props and and um, all your yoga supplies and clothing. There's a lot they have lots of different partners they work with. Okay. Um, that's one benefit that I have used. Okay. They now have um, Oh, what is, it's like, if, if they were an employee, it's like employee assistant program okay. that you would normally get through a company. They have something like that where they're offering now, um, mental health benefits and counseling services, okay. which I think is great. That's really good. I can't wait for the day when they offer medical insurance. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> then I'm all over it. I'm in it mostly as you, as you mentioned, tracking my hours. Cause I think it's great to just have a good log of that. If I didn't have yoga Alliance, I don't know where I would keep track of these things. Right, yeah, totally. yeah. Um, and then it's always nice. I love hitting milestones. So like the 200 hour, the 500 hour, the, you know, the E200, the YSEP. And so now the next thing I have to do is complete another thousand to have my E500. And then wow. there's not much else I can do. Right. Yeah. Um, besides open my own school. Yep. Um, so the, there are benefits. I do know that they work really closely with schools. So okay. I think the benefits are mostly, you know, to the schools when, um, when they're graduating to students. Okay. If there's a grievance, uh, the school and Yoga Alliance do communicate. Okay. Um, most often before a grievance is filed. All right. And so I think there's a benefit to the student in that way, or to the, sorry, to the school. I'm not sure if, um, I've never filed a grievance, so I don't know what that process is like. Mm-hmm. Um but uh, I'm not sure what kind of support is given to people who do file grievances. Yeah. Um, I don't think I've ever been contacted through the directory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think I have either. Um, I let him think about it. It's been years since I've been active on that directory, but yeah, yeah. I just updated everything. So I'll let you know <laughs> yeah, right. if I do get something through there. Um, and I remembered searching for stuff that I knew existed and I couldn't find it in there. Okay. So I'm not sure how, how up to date everything is for me. It's definitely great for tracking. It's yeah. great for milestones. And because some places may want you to have your, um, validation or whatever right. <laughs> registration, Registry, not yeah. validation yeah. registration through yoga Alliance. And they'll ask you for, you know, your, your member number mm. or your, uh, credentials. Right. 
And that's really why I have it. Okay. And uh, I definitely come from a family that looks at those credentials. And yeah. so I also print it out every time for my parents to see like, hey, guys, <laughs> I'm doing something. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. Uh-huh. Crest. Got <laughs> yes, it. yes. Um, that's really it. Okay. I think it looks official, yeah. but it's also, you know, they are self proclaimed governing agency. Right. And yeah. so there's nothing that says because someone is registered with Yoga Alliance that they're a better teacher than anybody else. Right. Um, you can look great on paper. Right. But and um, a vibe is a vibe. <laughs> and if you, um, if you resonate with a teacher, you won't know that because of their accreditation and where it's at. Right. That's so... I, I have it to cover all my bases because mm-hmm. I think um, I, I do love space holding. I love people. And I know that some people need those things to trust first. Yeah, definitely. And uh, in the end, it's going to be my character that validates the work that I do. There you go. I mm-hmm. love that. I think, uh, you know, we're in a time now where Yoga Alliance has an opportunity to really step up as that governing body. Um, you know, at least in the Northwest, um, we've had a little bit more, um, I guess, business standardization starting to happen with yoga. Um, whereas, you know, before I could teach at three different studios, but not be an employee at any of those studios, basically a vendor 1099 kind of tax stuff. Uh, but now, um, I'm not sure how it is with RCF, but, um, the main studios that I work at up here have made us become employees and Mm. basically W nine employees. We're on their payroll now. We're all that. And a lot of that was tracking from the, you know, from the government side, um, knowing who's working, what that's looking like. And so there is a bit more government involvement that's starting to happen now that yoga is becoming more popularized. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's yoga corporations now like core power, yoga six, you know, um, true, true fusion has uh, big corporate uh, backings and a lot of yoga programs. Um, but with that also, um, there's uh, like BMI, ASCAP, right? These these governing music bodies mm-hmm. that are starting to now call the yoga studios and say, hey, technically your yoga class is a live music event and mm-hmm. you have to pay the rights to play the music that you're playing. Oh. And we've had uh, the two studios that I work at have to pay, I think it's like almost seven, 800 bucks a, uh, a year mm-hmm. um, for there's three, there's ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and I can't remember, there's actually, there's four. Um, that basically one governs the United States music, one governs Britain music, one covers indie music and blah, blah, blah. Okay. And so basically like be, they could come in and say, Hey, you're playing that music without the rights. You have to pay us a thousand dollars now. Mm. Right. And so countless yoga studios are having to deal with that. But as things start to get more, um, that standardized idea, what I'm th- interested to see is what yoga Alliance is going to do with that because, they are that governing body. They are the kind of uh, standardization of what the certifications look like. And is now the government going to go to the Yoga Alliance and say, hey, show me what your yoga sculpt accreditations look like. And we need to make sure that everybody's doing yoga sculpt mm-hmm. this way or everybody's doing vinyasa this way. You know, is there going to be that level of standardization that happens as we start to, you know, <laughs> become this more popularized genre of, of workout instead of this way of life? Right. And, and all those companies that you'd mentioned, they're very fitness based right. yoga and that's not the whole tree. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That's great. I love that. Uh, that's not the whole tree. And so, um, if you, if they want to standardize, um, fitness yoga, sure. Sure. Yeah. Asana based yoga. How about yeah. It? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for the whole tree (laughs) to be standardized. I think there already is, um, uh, (laughs) rule books, you know, yoga sutras of Patanjali and all the other Mm -hmm. great yogic texts that exist, um, that already tell us how to do it. Um, and that's where I, I really love the, like practicing things in traditional ways and things, um, you know, getting inspiration, I would say also through tradition. I don't, um, 
I don't think it's okay <laughs> to standardize everything that we do. Yeah. Um, and just to touch on the music, Yoga Alliance does have a music membership that you could mm. s- subscribe to. Okay. That gives you um, full access. Oh, that good to, to know. To some of those things. So. Good to know. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I it's it is kind of. Um, it feels limiting when you think of being standardized in, in that kind of way. Yeah. I do believe for educational purposes, having minimum requirements of like must teach these things. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Especially when it comes to safety of others. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, there should still always be some room for like lifestyle creativity in the teachings as well. Yeah. Um, because everyone's... Um, experience with yoga is going to be a totally different journey. And for some people, maybe it is just physical. For others, it is, they end up really just going deep into the meditative aspects of yoga. Yeah. And for others, it's a whole different journey where they decide to become a practitioner of bhakti, right, you know, yeah, and, right. and you just totally journey in a different way. Yep. That is, is what I hope doesn't get touched, right? Right. Um, so maybe, maybe it's the mainstream fitness yoga, and that's cool. Yeah, right. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's, you know, it's like, uh, I don't really want to compare it to this, but um, if you get a hamburger at the Golden Arches in Hawaii, it's going to taste the same as the hamburger at the Golden Arches in China. Right. 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 That's that standardization and so if yoga six wants everyone that goes to yoga six to have the same experience no matter which yoga six you go to yeah yep yeah and that's kind of what it is you know (laughs) like core power they have core power a core power b core power c these flows that they're standardized to teach and you're not allowed to teach anything outside of that so that basically is exactly what's happening like this, yeah, the McDonald's of, of yoga. Like I know what I'm going to get every time I go yeah, there. Yeah, and I think it's great for someone who's looking for consistency. Right. But as a teacher, I would not like that. No, no, I like uh, freedom. Yeah, that's not my style. But for some people, they need that structure. Right. They need that. Um, they like the wash, rinse, and repeat. Mm-hmm. And that is okay. Yep. Yep. I was talking to somebody the other day, <laughs> and they were saying that the studio that they're at, and it's not a corporate studio, um, uh, for their style of yoga, you're only allowed to teach six, uh, chaturangas. Oh. And if you teach more than that, then you're going to have a conversation after class. Oh. I'm like, Oh, okay. So we're now we're counting the postures and how many times we can do the well, postures. Who counts? I know. Right? <laughs> Jeez. I don't count. I don't know how many th- the chaturangas I throw into a class. Yeah. Oh. Like, we're just going to do them. Hopefully that's, it's an even amount, you know? <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You were talking a little bit about, also, well, we talked about the future of yoga being mm. standardized. And then I just thought, what is the future of yoga? Mm. And so I started doing a little research. Okay. And um, there's going to be a big, big future. And they were forecasting for the year 2060. Okay. That's <laughs> a bit away. I'll, I'll still be alive. Um, <laughs> in the year 2060, there will be over 19 million Americans that are over the age of 85. Holy shit. And right now, um, there are only like 6.5 million. Wow. Okay. And what the, what they were saying is the future of yoga is actually ne- the need to learn how to teach older demographics. Mm-hmm. The need to be able to teach accessible yoga, very modified yoga. Right. And I think it's great because it's people our age that will be that age right, at yeah, that time. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I want someone to teach me gently and kindly totally. and, and in a safe way. Um, I love that because, you know, there's there's a thing right now where, uh, you know, people have written books about like Stephen um, Jenkinson, I think is the most recent book I read, but uh, basically people being afraid to step into their eldership. And... You know, the more we become comfortable with those stages of life, you know, we step into our eldership, then we can pass that knowledge down. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're in a world right now where we've been uh, trying to look younger, act younger, be younger for the past 30 years, right? Since about the 80s. Mm-hmm. And so when we step into that realm of trying to act, be, and stay young, we're never going to embrace the age that we are and we can never impart that wisdom down to those next generations. Mm-hmm. And so for me, something like that shows me that like I'm in exactly the right place because yeah. I'm embracing my age. I'm getting older with the practice that I love and I appreciate and I love dearly. 
And so that I can start to make that practice work and fit for people coming behind me, Mm -hmm. people that are older than me. Mm -hmm. So that can still be a lifestyle practice and not just something that I can only do when I can sweat. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, how do we keep moderate? How do we keep integrating this, this practice into our age, into our, into our older years? Yeah. And as the teachers that are going to be teaching that too, like that gives us a, a, a stronghold in that walk towards our eldership because Mm -hmm. we need to understand and embrace our eldership to be able to keep the people safe that are taking those classes. Yeah. I'm Love excited. That. Yeah. I'm excited to get old. I am too. I really am. <laughs> yeah. I really am. I'm embracing it. I've always said, I can't wait to see what my face is going to look like all wrinkly. And I don't know if you're familiar with Ayurveda, but uh-huh. I'm, I'm Vata. Okay. And, yep. and once I, you know, pass menopause, I'll be in the Vata stage of life, okay. which means I'm going to be much more prone to wrinkles. Oh, all right. <laughs> so I can just imagine myself with like super cute, wrinkly, yeah. crinkly skin. <laughs> That's great. I <laughs> love that. But hopefully that just, you know, really shows up when I'm 80. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you embrace those wrinkles. Yeah. All I think it's going to be so great. And, you know, keeping my yoga practice and, you know, keeping the peace within there so that go. whatever's happening outside of me is not... My problem. There you go. I love that. <laughs> um, yeah, I did. I did want to mention just you know overall um, that for me it's just always returning to traditional practices mm. that really calls me. So that's why I just love learning more and more about the history of yoga. Um, it really makes me embrace, as I mentioned, I think earlier today to you, just the the differences of everybody. I honor everyone and their points of view, their, their place in the learning cycle of life. And the fact that we're not all here to learn the same things. Right. Um, and, uh, I just love, 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 love the deep roots of, of yoga, ancient texts and teachings. And it just always 100% brings me to a place of total acceptance mm. of myself and others. And, um, I just hope that other people will be inspired in, in that same way. Um, for that world peace. There you go. There you go. I love that. And yeah. you know, you mentioned something about, you know, our, our being on our paths, mm-hmm. right? And we mentioned the word just earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, like, oh, I'm just this or I'm just that. Um, there's something I've been trying to do work on myself lately and it kind of revolves around that. But it's those stories we tell ourselves and, and the stories that we have made for others, right? So being, a, uh, being in corporate management for the number of years that I, that I was, um, I always looked for the potential that people didn't see within themselves and I thought I was doing right, but who am I to say you're not living to your full potential? Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm okay. Just being a server. I don't want to be a manager. Okay, great. Right. Be the you that you want to fucking be right. Be, take the word just out of it. I'm going to be a server and I'm going to make this money and I'm going to leave this job, not have to take it home with me, then go home and have the best family life that I could possibly have. Right. I could be the manager and that manager is my job and I love developing people and I love helping people on their path. And I really appreciate the job that I have, but my home life is kind of shitty. Mm-hmm. Right. There's no just right. It's wherever we want to be and where we want to show up at and how we want to put our energy towards that. And so I think when we can take that understanding about ourselves and we can look at that in other people and say, no, you're exactly where you need to be. You're not just this. You're exactly where you need to be. So mm-hmm. embrace that shit. You yeah. Know? Um, I don't know why it just came to me hearing the word just over and over again. Yeah. I think of justice. Yeah. Okay. And it's like, so now I'm going to say, if I catch myself saying I'm just, I'm going to say I'm justified being a yoga ah, teacher. Like I'm justified that. living at my parents' house. There you go. I'm justified driving the same old car, you know, just justified. Justified. Hell justified. Yeah. I'm justified. Love that. Love that. <laughs> justified as I am. Uh-huh. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's end by talking about some of the cool shit that you're working on right now. Right. So you have this beautiful program. Yeah. I mean, you, so you've kind of alluded to like being a director production, you've done a lot of things, you've done pageantry (laughs) work, you've done like all these cool things that have those transferable skills that we keep talking about to get you to this beautiful place that you're at in life now. And some of that passion is now bringing art into all of our surrounding communities. Yes. I'm so just amazed at what you're talking about. So please fill us in on what you're working with. Yeah. So, um, I've been blessed to have 
all sides of my brain activated mm. <laughs> as a child. Yeah. I was both creative and analytical. Okay. And I chose the analytical path because logically it made sense financially. But everything I loved to do in my life was so creative. Mm. And um, I've done, as I mentioned, everything from engineering. I was a calculus tutor for 13 years. <laughs> I did a lot of Good like <laughs> nerdy stuff. I was, yeah. I was in the band, but then at the same time, I was also in dance team. Okay, right. So I did dance. Anyway, so I have a background with choreography, with um, modeling and acting. I've done direct, I've directed, I've produced, I have done a lot of things on both sides of the camera, on both sides of the community, mm. as both a participant of events and a creator and host of events. And um, I've been blessed with the opportunity to work with um, a company named Madrid Events. Okay. And we are rebranding in a way that um, puts us in a position to create um, experiential marketing opportunities, which comes in the form of arts, culture, and entertainment um, in the communities so that we can enrich the culture and enrich the, uh, the community members to really celebrate what they have within their community and yeah. get to know each other and understand each other. A lot of people don't realize the gems that live right next door to them because um, they just haven't seen it. Right. And so many communities need the um, need something to bring them together. Art is universal. Music yeah. is universal. Culture is specific, but a, a culture can be celebrated by everybody. Right. And there's nothing that people love more than other people celebrating their culture and saying, wow, that's so awesome. Yes. And so we um, are actively working with... Um, a couple locations, uh, both in the South Puget Sound area and North Puget Sound area. And I'm really hoping to also bring an element of wellness in the form of children's um, uh, like wellness programs. Mm. So I have kind of a kid zen summer program yeah. um, that I've actually, it came to me the day after your sound bath. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I was like, just driving home and I was like, Oh my gosh, I have it. And I like came home and I wrote it down and I have all seven days planned out. Oh, wow. All right. Yes, I'm ready. Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm ready. I just have to pitch it to somebody and I know it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, it's going to be an amazing thing. I, I think getting children from a, a young age to, uh, be able to understand, um, what they're, capable of in terms of self-soothing, self-healing, um, understanding their emotions, um, and, and having different ways to move the energy. So through yoga movement, through meditation, through sound healing, you're going to be called for that. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> um, through sound healing, journaling, yeah. having healthy conversations, knowing how to tell somebody I need to talk. Mm. Um, those little things, mindfulness, mindfulness when you're eating, um, high vibrational language. I'm definitely going to start teaching children. Um, I just think if we get them while they're young, they'll grow up with it. And those are going to be our teachers there when we're go. in our eighties that we there were just talking go. about. Hell yes. So maybe through this summer program, I can inspire somebody to be my teacher when I'm 80. Mm, How fun that. would that That'd be? be great. <laughs> I, you know, that's, yeah. I'm, I, I share your passion with that. And I've talked about that in the podcast a few times, but you know, just <clears throat> why are we so aware of our somatic responses to our bodies, but we're not being taught it. We still need to like find that knowledge. And then it's not like, it's not widely known. It's specialized. Start teaching these kids now. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't care about who signed the declaration of independence and when, right. Learn how to downregulate your nervous system by breathing. Learn how to upregulate your nervous system by breathing. Take yourself out of a panic attack. Learn how to meditate. Like all these things that like we now know are super beneficial to our physiology, our kinesiology, like everything about our bodies, but we're still not being taught this stuff on well, a regular basis. Right. And it's being prescribed by doctors right. to, to do yoga and to do these breathing, but they're even kind of taking the words away and they're not saying this is a pranayama exercise. They say this is, I actually wrote one down. It's cardiac coherence breathing. 
Okay. Well, thank you very much. I think the same way that um, many of us will um, do land acknowledgements when we have public events, I do that when I do full moon circles and uh-huh. ceremonies. I do public acknowledgement. There should or uh, land acknowledgement. There should be the same for the origins of whatever you're prescribing and teaching people. There you go. Because this is five thousand years old. Right. Yeah. <laughs> This isn't something that even just developed new, Mm -hmm. like Kundalini actually is the youngest of all yogas. This is the very, there was only one yoga posture when this all started, and it was Sukhasana, Mm. sitting cross-legged in stillness, steadiness and ease with your breath, Mm. with yourself. If people could just do that for five minutes a day. And what did the people call it? What? Just chill. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just go sit in the corner and chill uh-huh. that shouldn't be punishment yeah exactly it's like that should be for yeah that's a prescription yeah. Wait, hit me with that term one more time cardiac coherence breathing cardio coherence breathing <laughs> okay so that reminds me I, I read a book a while back and i can't remember the book um, but they had a scientific term for the word love Oh, gosh. And they wanted to do this, and uh, I'm trying to remember why. Uh, there was a lot of experiments going on with the uh, the heart bios field, and they didn't want to just use the word love because they're scientists, so they came up with a, a scientific term, unconditional positive regard. Wow. Like, just, just, I can mean, you I just like water it too. that? I know, in a way, it's like, <laughs> I, you know, I, I use it in my yoga classes sometimes because not everybody likes to hear the love and yeah. likes to hear, you know, so I'm like, hey, y'all, un- an unconditional positive regard for like, it, you know? I have unconditional positive regard for all human beings yes. and all living beings there on this go. earth. There you go. <laughs> That's so great. It's I love that, it. It's that, that PhD watered down, yes. but hey, it gets the point across. I kind of like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, so a couple other things uh-huh. that I'm working on. Um, I'm planning retreats for mm, this year. Beautiful. I haven't decided where they're going to be. Okay. Um, I just know that there's going to be a couple different styles. One is going to be a restful, peaceful healing retreat. Mm where you're not asked to learn anything. There you go. You're there to be on those (laughs) black sand beaches. (laughs) And the other retreat is going to have optional workshops for people that want to deepen their practice. Or if they are existing yoga teachers, it would be count as a continuing education for them. Great. So you still get a retreat Mm -hmm. with a little bit of learning, but it's still going to be a nice, easy flowing program. And I'm also working on workshops um, to do at RCF and Mm. other yoga studios that may right. want uh, some of these workshops and it's going to be basic stuff like pranayama and meditation i'm going to do a four class eight limb series mm. um and then those are combined with some asana labs as well so you can come learn a little bit about the philosophy and then work on your yoga technique All right. for certain poses and postures and then uh, high vibrational language which i think is great for Anybody, whether you practice yoga or not, um, especially people that are in management, leadership, executive uh, right. positions, uh, the 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 more you can elevate the vibration of the words that you speak, the more people will want to listen to you, and the more people will be ready when you need something from them. Right. Um, and also, it's there are nice, beautiful, gentle ways to tell people something that might be hurtful that will actually make them feel good because right. of how you said it. Yep. And those are things that I think everyone should learn. I agree. Uh, <laughs> I agree. And then um, also um, just mala workshops. So making ah. those people, I'm holding mine up, but you can't see it. So those uh, <laughs> necklaces, I'll say that people wear around their necks and sometimes around their brace, uh, around their wrists like a bracelet. They often have tassels at the end. Those are used for japa mala meditations. And um, so I will... Uh, be talking about that style of meditation with mantras, uh, learning the difference between mantras and affirmations Mm. and talking a little bit about uh, the Sanskrit language as well, um, and the significance of 108. Ah, yes, <laughs> yes, those divine numbers. Yeah, so I have some fun workshops, wow. and I'm always open to um, specialty workshops that people are interested in, um, 
always open to one-on-one classes with individuals. And I have some people from previous classes at RCF that are keep asking when my next class is. I'm, if you're listening, I'm not on the schedule. <laughs> I'm currently a sub because I wanted to leave some time open to create these workshops. Beautiful. Um, so I'm also just willing to have any conversations with people about yoga. Um, I'm available on Instagram at Michelle Marie Font, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-M-A-R-I-E-F-O-N-T. Um, I always uh, check my DMs, so always awesome. open to have a conversation. Beautiful. And I'll put links to all the contact info for, for Michelle in our, in our show notes. Um, and I love the openness, right? I, I, I share that openness. Like, I love helping people find the answers if I can't give it to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the thing I love most, and I talk about this in my sound baths a lot, is I love pe- being people's weird friends. Right? Yes. And this can be like a weird avenue of life to dip your toe into if mm-hmm. you're not familiar with it, if you don't know, have a guide or somebody. Um, and I love being people's weird friends and exposing them to all this cool, awesome stuff that's changed my life in the most beautiful way, but can seem very strange to an outsider. Yeah. Um, so like tap into that stuff. Like Michelle just offered her like assistance in talking about yoga, like about these teacher training programs. Like if there's somebody out there that's going to give you the ear, take it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful information to get. Yeah. Yeah. And if you follow me on Instagram, I'm always posting things about uh, the moon, the planets, and the energy that's happening around us. Because sometimes we get weird feelings and Mm. we don't know why. And the answer is out there in the universe for you. So um, if you just want some fun content to, to help you tune into your own energy, you can also follow me on Instagram. Beautiful. Well, Michelle, thank you for your contribution to humanity. It sounds like you're doing just a lot of cool things. You're helping people deepen their practices, learn new information. You're bringing art to communities that didn't have art. You're helping people with all these different things. And it just seems like it's barely scratching the surface of what you're going to continue to offer. Mm -hmm. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for your offerings. Um, If I can ever be any of help uh, in your journey, promotions, helping with workshops, whatever it is, let me know. You're the best. Thank you so much. This has been so fun. And I am just at the very beginning. I feel so green. Yeah. And like I feel like I want to share so much with people. And there's so much more that I still want to learn. So I know this is definitely just the beginning. There you go. Thank you so much. I look forward to having you back. Thanks. Thank you so much for spending time with Michelle and I. Uh, Please reach out to us. Our contact info is in the show notes. So if you have any further questions or need some clarification on any of the topics we discussed, how to find the trading program that fits you best, please, please don't uh, hesitate to reach out. And as always, please like and subscribe to the show. Share it with your friends. Share it with anybody you feel will benefit from it. No basins in love. We'll see you all next time.